Now that we've begun our discussion of multi-layer networks, let's now focus on the algorithms that you'll use to go from data to a multi-layer network model. The core component of these models is you want to have a system that takes some input and maps it to some output. And so if you're doing classification, your input are the raw inputs. So for example, the pixels in an image or the words in a document. Those come in and you want to have a final output that says, is this a spam email or not, for example. In between, which is why we call it a multi-layer network, you have other neurons computing intermediate functions. And so here you have what's called a hidden layer. So this is not your input x, which you know a priori, or your output that you know the answer to on your training data, but something entirely under-described in your problem specification. So this is something that your algorithm must use to learn how to do the job. So let's take a look at one of these hidden nodes. This is going to be called A, and we'll use a subscript to say that it is the first one, and we'll use a superscript to say that it is on the second layer. Of course, we can add in a bunch of these hidden layers, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll just add one hidden layer right here. Let's take a look at the formula for one hidden node in this hidden layer. So this node is computed from all of the inputs, and so x1 all the way to x3 in this example, and that gets multiplied by some weight vector w, and then you add in a bias. And so this internal node has its own set of feature coefficients, w, and we're going to use the same subscripts and superscripts as before. So w11 means that this is going to be used with the first feature in the first hidden node, W12 is going to be used with the second feature in the first hidden node, and W13 is going to be used with the third feature in the first hidden node. And the superscript 1 says that this is operating on the input layer that you get directly from your data. You then add to all of that a bias term specific for that hidden node. And we do exactly the same thing for the next hidden node down. You have its own parameter vector, w2, that gets multiplied by all the feature vectors. You add in a bias term, and then that gets passed through an activation function, just like for the first hidden node. And then you have exactly the same thing for the third hidden node in the first hidden layer. All of that gets multiplied by a feature vector specific to that hidden node, add in a bias specific to that hidden node, you pass that through an activation function. And from that, we now can create our output. And our output is basically a logistic regression using all of these hidden nodes as features. So you take the result of those hidden nodes, multiply them by some feature vector specific to the output layer, you add in a bias term specific to the output layer, and then you pass that through an activation function. And so now you have basically created a logistic regression problem with features that you're learning from the input. And those features are learned through activations of the raw input, which themselves look like logistic regression. Everywhere you have an orange node in this picture, you have a function that looks a lot like logistic regression. What's different is that the inputs to the logistic regression on the final layer are learned and not given to you as data. So you need to learn the weights and the biases that will generate these features, and then the weights and the biases that will take those features into your final answer. And that final answer, recall, is a standard supervised machine learning problem that can either be classification or regression. Because it's a little bit simpler, we'll talk about regression here. In a standard regression setup, we want to minimize the error between 
the final prediction for an example, and the label. And we'll take a standard squared loss approach here, and we'll multiply it by one half so that uh, the derivatives work out correctly. And we'll also uh, sum this over all examples to get a sense of how much error we're making on all of the examples. If the weights get too large, this can lead to odd degenerate solutions to our problem. So if we keep the weights small, this will often lead us to a better solution more quickly. So there are a lot of sums here, so let's walk through this a little bit slowly here. So we're summing over all of the layers. So uh, we have our input layer, we have hidden layers, and we have the output layer. We need to consider all of them. And then for each layer, you can have many different sources. Basically, all of the previous nodes in the uh, preceding layer. So you have to sum over all of those sources. Those each have their own weight. So let's say that you have two input nodes. You have one hidden layer with two nodes inside there, and then you finally have your output. And the hidden nodes take all possible sources, and so you need to sum over all of the nodes on the previous layer feeding into this layer, and sum over all of the possible destinations within your current layer. So this adds up to a lot of parameters, and these parameters typically aren't shared. So putting it all together, we have an objective function that looks like this. It's a little intimidating, but it's relatively simple in concept, and a lot of it reuses the same building blocks over and over again. And our goal is to make the error as small as possible. And this is a function of the weights and the biases. So we want to learn the weights and the biases that cause this function to be as small as possible. Like a lot of the algorithms, we're going to start off with some guess of what the solution could be, and we'll initialize all of the w's and all of the b's to be near zero. And we'll adjust the w's and the b's to make this overall error term smaller and smaller, iteration by iteration. And like logistic regression, we'll use stochastic gradient descent to answer this problem, or an algorithm like it. And so the way that this works is that you have some initial error, and you're then going to update your w's and your b's to slightly decrease your error. You get that answer, and you now look, how can I decrease my w's and my b's to make that error even smaller? Okay, so you'll walk down this error function, updating your w's and your b's as you go until you finally get to a place where your error is relatively low. Unlike logistic regression, the loss function here is totally non-convex. That means that there are places where you can get stuck. And so there may be a better solution over here that might have a lower overall error, but you won't reach it because there's no way, if you're walking downhill, to get from here to here. So often you have to restart your program over and over again to try to search for lower error. So let's talk about why these functions have such a crazy objective function. Why is it non-convex? So here we'll have to look at the math a little bit deeper. So for convenience, let's write the input to a sigmoid function in terms of a single variable z. So this is basically just what will get input into a sigmoid at any particular node. So you take some layer L and you're looking at the ith node in that layer. Let's write the input to that node's sigmoid function as Z -I -L. So the algorithm that we use to optimize this function tries to find the direction that will decrease the error. This is the gradient. And the gradient is a function, quite naturally, of the error that every node is making. And for the output node, it's very straightforward to figure out what the error is. And so for the final output node, the error is the difference between what your model output and what the right answer should have been. 
So this makes total sense as the error. And then, because you're applying the chain rule, you're going to multiply that by the derivative of the activation function. So if you've forgotten your calculus, or you never learned it in the first place, that's okay. This is something that you can just look up. We're just applying some rules from calculus. You don't need to actually derive anything here. Okay, so we are figuring out how to update our weights and biases based on the node error. And for output nodes, that makes a lot of sense. But what does it mean for a hidden unit to make an error? Now recall that these hidden nodes are features, some representation of the data that we're learning. And so they don't mean anything. What does it mean for them to make an error then? So this may seem like an undefined problem, but we can use a concept called backpropagation. And backpropagation is a fancy word for applying some calculus rules. And so we're not going to derive the backpropagation here. If you know calculus, it's handy uh, to go through this and just to make sure that it, it matches what we get here. But intuitively, after the fact, it makes a lot of sense. So what does it mean for an internal hidden node to make an error in this case? Basically, what happens if you apply calculus is that the error of downstream nodes, so for example, the final output node, gets pushed back to the nodes that made it make whatever decision it made. And this kind of makes sense. You can think about logistic regression as a vote, but votes aren't weighted equally. They're weighted based on these W parameters. So if a node makes a wrong decision, it can look at all of the people who voted, i.e., the nodes that fed into it, and say, hey, node 7, you had the largest vote. I blame you for my mistake. And then node 7 figures out that, oh, I, I made a mistake. Oh, my bad. I, I will take your error and count it as my own. So this is basically what's happening. The error is getting passed along or back propagated. It's called backpropagation because in the normal operation of a neural network, information is flowing from the input to your output node. But when you're computing the error, you're starting at the output node, seeing what mistakes were made, and then going in the opposite direction, the backwards direction, and propagating that error into the intermediate nodes. And so the error of a downstream node in layer L plus 1 gets multiplied by the weight that fed into the downstream node decision, so WJI L plus 1, and because of calculus that gets multiplied by the derivative of whatever activation function you're using. Once we've defined this notion of a mistake inside the network, it's quite simple to now figure out how we should update our weights and our biases. And so the weights get multiplied by the node's activations, and the biases get updated just by the error. So recall that the biases are independent of the inputs. And so if all of the parameters were zero, the bias would make the entirety of the decision. So we don't actually need the activation of a node to update the biases. We just need the error that the node made. So now we have a complete algorithm. So we can take the individual errors, turn them into gradients, and now we know what direction we need to move our parameters to decrease the error. So we can do this either for individual examples and do stochastic gradient descent, or we can do it for the entire data set and do regular gradient descent. And so in either case, you're going to take some set of examples, perhaps the entire data set, compute up the individual gradients, and then create new parameters w and beta. Just like for logistic regression, that gets multiplied by some learning rate, we'll call it alpha here, that then tells you how big of a step you want to take moving in that direction. And you repeat this process until your weights reach some equilibrium. So that's our brief introduction to multilayer networks.
In class, we'll see some examples of how these networks learn feature representations that let you do interesting nonlinear things, and we'll also have a brief example of doing backpropagation on a very simple network.